the guy, Joseph, I don't know how to say Quayar. it. Quayar. Quayar. So Danny met with him at a bar like the night before he was murdered. Is that right? No. They met. Like, they, met um, they met by chance. Met by chance. And it was... It was a couple months, I think, before. Oh, months okay. before he died. It was towards the end of his investigation, but it was it was it was it wasn't like the day before he died. And um, was that guy Coer? Was he seen near the hotel where Danny was during that twenty four hour, forty eight hour period? That's the question. Besides right? his the name, maid? I can tell you that his um, his name was floated to the Martinsburg police many times. I've got it in their notes. They never can spell it right. They have really tough time with spelling over there at Martinsburg Police Department. But and I think spelling is important. You're trying to look in databases for yeah people. <laughs> um, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, do I sound like a jerk? No, it's funny. It's funny. Okay. Um, so this, but they don't. No, I don't have any record of them calling him, interviewing him, checking him out, bringing, going, getting a photo of him from the driver's license or for the for the DMV or from the military or whatever, and like canvassing. Has anyone seen this man? We do have that um, that that sketch, mm -hmm. and we have a guy that kind of matches his description that another hotel guest was seen entering the room. Um, we have Quayar threatening um, Danny's friend Lynn Knowles to stop asking questions after Danny's death about what happened to Danny and what was Joe's involvement. Seems like a weird response if you're asking somebody like he hey, said something. It's business, right? Yeah, it, yeah. What you, Danny was investigating was a business, and if you care about your kids and your own life, just drink some hot cocoa and stop asking questions. Mm -hmm. It just seems like a odd response. And when he also told Tony yeah. at some point, like, I think I think he floated it that like, oh, I'll help the family investigate whatever happened, but didn't, you know, right. did attend the funeral. Who attended the funeral? Quayar. Really? Yeah. We, we had, man, we spent so much time. We had a tape that was kind of a pool, pool videography tape. They allowed one camera into the funeral and then disseminated it because there was so much news interest at that time mm -hmm. man we christian scrubbed that tape so much trying to find quayar in the footage it would have been incredible to find it but you know smart enough guy to either either got got lucky or or was smart enough to stay stay away from the camera oh. and then additionally is the story true that he died on a Saturday, and they didn't tell the family till Monday. Yeah. Danny Casalero. Yeah, Danny, Danny. Casalero. Yeah. yeah, correct. He Why died would they have waited so long? Well, well that was okay, one of the. So they, well, they did. They did. Uh, but it's the initial thing. That's the initial. Was in the room. It's not like they had to like identify who he was. Right. The initial thing was. I mean, that was one of the number one red flags for the family. It just was like, he died two days ago. And you've embalmed the body? Like, what about an autopsy? And they're like, well, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah. you guys aren't open on Saturday? You can wait till <laughs> Monday to you cry. But, but It's also but, like, there's like very few Casaleros in the United States, and I'm pretty sure they're all related. Mm -hmm. And they yeah, all know can, each other. You can call any of them, and the, you find out, like, yeah. who to talk to. Uh, but that, that was like an initial thing of like, what is going on here? Some sort of conspiracy. What's happening here? The mundane truth of it. Basically, they called the Fairfax. Danny lived in Fairfax County. So Martinsburg called Fairfax to send an officer to personally notify the family. So that officer drives to, and Danny is a single man who lives alone. This officer drives to Danny Casalero's home and leaves a business card. Please call me. This is important. Here's my number. And nobody calls him because nobody lives there anymore. Oh God, dude. But there's other Casaleros in Fairfax, you know. When did he leave the card? On Saturday. Okay. Yeah. So it's just kind of like a bad mm, police work, comedy of errors, tragedy of errors kind of situation for that. And the people, the guy who you said wrote the article for the Village Voice who believes that he was killed himself, how does that guy, how does he rationalize the fingernails missing and the tendons being severed and the blood everywhere? I think that he is... Doug Vaughn also, he's, he solved the Lapenka bombing. 
um, if you, you know you talk to Danny Sheehan, that's that's the that's the case that uh, th- that is that Danny brought forth with the with the, it ended up being like the yeah, Iran Contra, Iran Contra, mm-hmm. the Martha Honey Avergan case. Yeah, but but I just want to say, and Christian knows more about this, but like I just want to say, like I think that Doug leaves open the possibility of anything, but his default position, maybe kind of like mine, is just like in the absence of evidence of 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 a murder, you have to go with what seems to be the evidence which is like hey, there's a note and he killed himself like that's that's how he sort of looks at we, it am i right I, yeah yeah it, it, because the, he's going based basing it on the physical evidence no forced entry right. um, unfortunately but, the physical evidence is sort of controlled by the martinsburg police department <laughs> and FBI, right. what they want to le- leak out um we another nichols we a uh, 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 basically a family friend or kind of a family acquaintance like uh, the medical examiner from Louisville where we're from his name is also Nichols um, no relation yeah no relation we gave him all of the um, me- medical forensic files uh, for him to study and then we had a meeting with him and we went through it all and he said and this guy's like <laughs> I mean he op- he's founded the medical examiner's office right. in the 70s and and he's like one of the top has guys he, has he seen people that had committed suicide by cutting their own wrists <laughs> i think he's seen everything you know under the sun but right. basically what he doesn't dis okay. well, what he said was well, he was just like oh what you got here boys is suicide yeah really? but the thing is here's the thing that nobody talks about in medical examiner offices well let me give one more thing okay. before you because i know where your punchline is but but the other thing that he said is the other thing he said he's like well dr frost the medical examiner uh, of west virginia who did the autopsy he's like he's not doing you a lot of favors here like there's not a lot of details in the medical examiner's report that would really show everything that you would need to know to understand this case oh, you don't know what you don't know you don't know what you don't know and the and it's kind of like a, a slightly cursory Examination. Which, yeah, he wasn't like this. Is the most beautifully laid out uh, pathology report I've ever seen, boys. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Yeah, I'm like, going to teach like, There's it a lot of information. UML. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, no. But the thing is, that's that's sort of like you know, once you're like total weirdo freak like me, there are leave no trace hitmen. It's a job that people do, right? And the medical examiner doesn't count that in you know i mean as you you i guess they would go insane every single case but what did someone repel through the window and like <laughs> right. you know fly job. in and like you know did like the ethan from mission impossible do it you know <laughs> I, you know I, right um i forgot where I, where I was going somewhere with that um yeah no what i would be interested in finding out was like there's got to be a way to find like some sort of record of a history of people who have committed suicide by slashing their own wrists and what it looks like, right? Like how deep are the cuts? Do they typically do eight cuts? Do they typically cut yeah. the tendons? I mean, in our kind of cursory research on that stuff, I mean, it's, eh, there's everything under the sun. Also the fingernail yeah. issue that you bring up. Yeah. Do you always, yeah. He, Danny was a nail biter. Um, and, uh, and his nails were in the water for so long Got to you. Got to you. Got to count. You got to because the skin and the tissue gets like kind of waterlogged and and soggy and um, I don't know. Yeah. So well, how you long can't, though? He for we don't hours. Yeah, I mean he's found around twelve thirty p.m. and they said that the time of death was somewhere around. You know, they couldn't place it exactly, but I think it was like 9 to 9.30 a.m. Yeah, like when you sit in a bath with living tissue with a beating right. heart the for most... an hour and you're like all soggy, you know? What, like just getting like real round table about this right here, you know, which I think is a good opportunity. Like one thing that we don't go into in the show because we're really intent on, of course, we wanted to find out what happened to Danny, but we're really into also explaining Danny's story that he was on to because right. nobody's ever really encapsulated it, right. I think, in the way that we did. Um, and so... What we don't do is kind of like your traditional true crime thing where you go into like, here's like all of the forensic evidence of every single thing. You know, we, we're we not forensic pathologists and it would have just, it would have been impossible to do within the four episodes exactly. time that we had. And yeah. it would have stopped it down to a point where we're not telling a story anymore. We're just basically doing like a, 
uh, yes. a different thing. It's a different thing, and that's a cool thing. And maybe we'll do something like that in the future. But I would just there's a there's a, yeah there's a couple interesting things that like the theory of the Martinsburg police is that this guy Danny Casalero uh, spent the entire weekend or we uh, he's got there Thursday. He dies Saturday morning drinking you know just like drinking himself to death in some ways you know just like like he's drinking wine he's drinking beer blah blah blah, and he's like you know obviously in their mind wasted because he's so pissed off that he never got anywhere with this story and he kills himself in this kind of desperate weekend um but the problem is like there's no uh there's hardly any trace of alcohol in his there's no trace of alcohol in his in his blood and there's hardly any in his urine but there's like um, beer cans in the room there's beer and, cans and there's a half a wine bottle next to the next to the bathtub you know it's like right but there's also <laughs> shoestring there's like a shoestring on his body that came from shoes from his apartment or from his house like they well that you put that into the other category of like oh right. he, no, he planned on it like there's all kinds of different like conflicting yeah, totally and, evidence right but uh but, but yeah, his to house me was that, that so. the, well, he never locked his door. the The thing that to me is like, yeah, it's just like if your theory is that he was drinking the whole weekend and got wasted and killed himself, like, you know, your your heart stops beating when you kill yourself, and it stop your liver stops processing alcohol. So one would think that there would be some kind of alcohol in your system yeah. if you're wasted when you're killing yourself. He also weirdly was last seen at the Sheets coffee shop, like which is a block from the um, Sheridan where he died, um, at midnight, midnight buying a, a cup of coffee, hmm. which is like a... Yeah, you don't typically mix coffee with booze. Yeah, and then he died... Um, they think eight hours later. Um, yeah, it's, it's so. What was going on? Right. Yeah. He, he goes to the, the he goes to the Sheets whacked. coffee shop at midnight. There's two women there. One's behind the counter, and another's a customer who's just a friend of the of the of the lady behind the counter. And he orders coffee. He has to wait for them to brew it because they didn't have any. So he just she's because it's midnight <laughs> yeah it's midnight so he just hangs out there for like 10 minutes or whatever and she's just like yeah he seemed like a nice guy like we just kind of chatted up or wow. it was like you know just like shot the shit mm -hmm. for a few minutes and then she gave him the coffee for free because she was like he had to wait so I gave it to him for mm -hmm. free just to be nice and then he walks back presumably walks back to the Sheridan to drink his coffee um, where he then becomes so distraught despondent. that he can't even write a full suicide note and sign it and he has a fear of blood, which we don't even get into in the and show. And he had a fear of needles and, and needle like and blood, surgeries. which I also do. And so I really empathized with his, with what, with his supposed suicide, because I was like, I have that same fear. There's no way I would go out that way. No way. Right. I would do anything else. And I, you know, obviously, don't want to die. I like life. Yeah, make that very clear. But um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't. No, no. No fucking way would I cut myself mm -hmm. ever, you know? Right. Because I hate my, I hate, uh, blood is really cool when it's inside the body. <laughs>